uh, governance forum organized by the United Nations. We have a, 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 a very, a very interesting of participants today that I'm be happy to introduce to you right now before introducing the meeting itself. And in no particular order, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Victor Harrison, which is Commissioner for Economic Affairs of the African Union. Uh, I would like to welcome Guten Tag to Daniela Bronstrup, which is Deputy Director General and Head of the Regulatory, and head of regulatory Framework and she was also the former host, uh, part of the former host country and co-chair of the MAG. And she's, of course, from the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy in Germany. And good morning to uh, Armida uh, Salsia Ali Sheabana, and uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations uh, and Executive Secretary of uh, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. And good morning to Mr. He, who is the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization based in Geneva. And good morning to Daniel Trujillo, who is Executive Vice President, Vice President and Global Chief for uh, Ethics and Compliance, uh, for the Ethics and Compliance Office of the American Walmart. And then uh, good morning and bonjour to Guillain Marcel, and she's the founder and managing member of Resilience, that Resilience Capital Ventures LLC. Welcome, Dr. Marcel. And then good morning to Mr. Mukija Kitui, uh, Secretary General of ANCTA, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And last but not least, final but not finally, uh, Mr. Edward Anderson is the Chief Information Officer and Director of the Information Technology Department of the IMF. Uh, as you unfortunately know very well, we are in the middle of a very dire pandemic. And all the economies of the planet so far have been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic itself. And the effect is that we cannot meet today in person, but we got to do it through the digital, and that's why we are discussing this, because the use of digital technologies can help reduce the harm. And for instance, through placing more importance on digital trade and remote work and remote working as we are doing uh, right now. Uh, but of course, we know that this process in, in many economic areas can also bring some concerns, and these are related to accessibility, inequality and security, just and security, just to mention a couple of them. And as you know very well, the Secretary of the United Nations, Gutierrez, has promised, uh, has, has committed himself to present before the end of the year his, his roadmap for a digital cooperation is a document which will be very important to uh, tackle diversity and to help the world to have a better digitalized uh, uh, relation. So that's why we have this panel of high level discussions and we are going to try to explore the role of the internet and the public digital policy and see uh, uh, what, uh, what is the role it can play uh, for the economic recovery in the post emergency situations and what improvements are needed to go forward. Now, uh, I will ask each of the panelists or each of the panelists to switch on their mics and switch on their video so we can go into our little show. And I remind you, you have no more than three minutes to answer my questions. And the first one is for Mr. Arison uh, uh, for, for the African Union. Now, very, very plainly, uh, I'm wondering how did COVID-19 affect the economy in the African Union overall? And what do you think are uh, the policies uh, on utilizing digital technologies that can reduce the pandemic negative impacts? And which are the, the, the solution that you think should be prioritar prioritar uh, yeah. That's Italian, very difficult. Prioritarize, Dr. Reyes. In Italiano, it's prioritizzata, prioritizzata. I cannot say it in Italian as well. So you've got three minutes. Thank you, Chair. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic has considerable 
socio-economic impacts in Africa. Among the economic impacts, we can mention a recession of between minus 4.9% to minus 2.1%, according to the estimates of the African Union. A loss of at least in dollar 65 billion in terms of foreign trade, a considerable drop in oil and commodity prices, a sudden increase in the inflation rate, losses in public revenue and external financing, including remittances and FDA to African countries. In the meantime, public spending is on the rise because of unforeseen expenditure on health and social measures needed to deal with a pandemic and contain it. The prevalence of a food crisis due to a contraction in agricultural production of between 2.6% and 7%. A slowdown of industry and the weakened private sector, yet it is the engine of growth. The most affected sectors include agricultural sector, accommodation and food services, manufacturing, etc. On the social level, the pandemic had significant impact in the area of health and has aggravated social development issues linked to poverty, to risk of famine, to loss of jobs. For the second question, the Economic Affairs Department has launched launched last October a report on the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 on Africa, an opportunity to build more indigenous and resilient emerging economies. I will only develop the paragraph on the leveraging digitalization, which can answer the questions. Policies promoting the utilization of digital technologies in Africa to reap the benefits of a fourth industrial revolution are guided by the African Union Digital Transformation Strategy for Africa 2020-2023. According to the World Bank, reaching the African Union's goal of an overshall and affordable internet coverage will increase GDP growth in Africa by 2% per year. Indeed, the emergence of digital area has offered colossal opportunities that can be enhanced for Africa's socio-economic transformation. Let me give you some in initiatives. One, Digitalization is making aid headways in the agricultural sector in Ghana and in Nigeria. Digitalization is improving healthcare system in Kenya and in Cameroon. In response to COVID-19 pandemic, a number of countries have used technology to detect and limit the spread of the, of the virus. Madagascar has developed a digital platform to identify and track infected cases. In education, education is also reaping the benefits of digitalization. Some university, universities in Egypt, Ghana, South Africa, etc. Digital finance services are, have grown in Africa with a positive effect on financial inclusion and the African continental free trade area. A flagship project of Agenda 2063 will be operationalized from the January 2021. According to the UNECA, the African free trade, continental free trade area will raise intra Africa trade from 15% to 
25% uh, compared to Africa with it, the African free trade area. It also has the potential to provide an appropriate platform for digital trade as the potential of digital trade to drive economic development and transformation in Africa remains largely unexplored. I thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And uh, you've given us a clue about how digital solutions can uh, help uh, Africa to tackle a problem which is now a food crisis, uh, mainly, and leads to a very uh, poor uh, situation in the country. I guess, I guess it's pretty different in Germany, but uh, differences and difficulties would be different there. And uh, I ask uh, uh, Dr. Brunstrup, Daniela, and how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect Germany? And which are the digital technologies and the digital solutions that you are foreseeing in order to try to tackle the pandemic? Thank you and good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's fair to say that for us in Germany, the pandemic has developed from an unwanted and of course unexpected stress test to an accelerator of digitalization in all areas of life. The operator of the world's largest internet mart is situated in Frankfurt and it reports that internet traffic has increased dramatically during the pandemic. For example, video calls have increased by 120%. And the data traffic uh, amounts to 9.1 terabyte per second right now. Therefore, I'm really happy to say that we haven't experienced any failure of our digital infrastructure throughout the pandemic. But certainly, the coronavirus has also exposed some digital deficits we have in Germany. I think, however, that it's more important that the crisis has put those deficits and digitalization as a whole very high top on the agenda by all decision makers. The crisis also forced companies and particular SMEs to improve their efficiency and financial stability. Our government decided to give an additional boost through an extended set of tax write-offs for digital assets and a funding program for SMEs, as an example. More and more people expect every service to be digitalized, accessible, and companies, of course, as well. This is what we will foster now um, by our Online Access Act. One essential tool helping to reduce the pandemic's negative impact is, of course, contact, tracer, contact tracing. This wouldn't be possible without digital technologies. In Germany, the coronavirus virus warning app uh, is a very good example of how digital technologies can help us to uh, fight against the pandemic. But this is only true if people trust them. And that is why transparency, data protection, and decentralized data storage were just as important for us as the principle that its use should, of course, be voluntary to everybody. And this has worked quite well in Germany. More than 18 million people are now using the coronavirus warning app, and it is still being downloaded every two seconds from one of the stores. And last but not least, we are just beginning to exploit the potential of digital education. The experience of the coronavirus crisis has made it clear that digital education is not only feasible, but also extremely reasonable. So even though we, of course, faced um, a lot of economic trouble due to the crisis, we are now looking much more positively into the year 2021 right now uh, we expect an economic growth of 4.4% in Germany for next year. Thank you. Well, thank you to you, Daniela. And uh, you said that more and more people expect uh, services to be digitalized, and now it's probably the future. 
so that gives me uh, the chance to to ask a question to Armida Salcia Alicia, uh, Alicia Albana, which is Under Secretary uh, General of the United Nations, uh, and, and talk about Asia and Pacific, because this is a region which is in the forefront of digital innovation, but. Uh, of course, as we can see, it's a region where uh, the digital divide is, is, is growing and where differences are growing too. And uh, uh, there are new forms of development gaps, which the COVID-19 pandemic uh, 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 has made bigger. So uh, the question is, 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 is pretty simple. Can you tell us more about the regional uh, specificities of your digital divide? And, and, and what do you plan to do to try to solve this, this not irrelevant problem? The floor is to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco, for the question. Very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. So um, uh, let me uh, respond to the question. So basically on first on the regional specificities, yeah? Again, our region, Asia Pacific, certainly is a very diverse and also dynamic region. So therefore, in terms of this digital divide or digital connectivity, uh, the, the, the specific or uh, the specificities on our region is the three speed, if I may. Uh, uh, call it a three-speed region in digital connectivity as well as innovation in which there are countries, the advanced or the more developed economies and some of the upper middle income countries in our region, which basically these countries are the, the, the frontier yeah, in terms of uh, uh, digital technology. Uh, and these countries have, uh, let's say, not only the 4G, but they already started the 5G, and even they are developing the 6, 6G digital connectivity. Coverage and usage is widespread, yeah? and uh, also including affordable and reliable in terms of internet connection. And then there are these uh, middle-income countries. Actually, majority of countries in Asia-Pacific region are middle-income countries, of course, lower middle-income countries, and few of them are uh, the so-called upper middle-income countries. And a remarkable dynamism in terms of closing the digital and innovation gap yeah, in these countries. Although, of course, inequality, there's a digital divide within the countries, yeah, within the respective countries, is still uh, prevalent. And then the third Category, uh, category of countries are the countries that still have very limited access, internet access. And in fact, they, according to the latest data, still around 2.3 billion people uh, are, are offline, wh while many millions remain un under connected. Again, yeah, Asia Pacific as a whole is about 4.6 billion. So half is still offline and many, many millions remain under connected. And again, uh, there are these countries that belongs to LDCs and then landlocked developed countries and states, small island developed states, where the broadband internet is unaffordable uh, for the majority, still, yeah, majority of the population. So on proposed solutions, uh, we see that, of course, uh, this is uh, addressing digital di divide, especially now, even more so, becomes a matter of very, very high policy priority uh, so therefore, how to close this digital divide? And also uh, in terms of COVID-19 recovery, uh, in terms of the stimulus package uh, priorities, uh, I think it has to go uh, into, into also this, yeah, how to close this di digital divide in the sense of building the digital infrastructure, both hardware and software, of course. And therefore, countries in the region needs yet yeah, to push for the big investment including the planning for that to leapfrog into the next generation of networks. Yeah? Because otherwise, then uh, you, 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 uh, you, know, uh, you lag, yeah? uh, lagging behind, um, you know, uh, started to, to compound yeah? the, the, the problem. And then how to incentivize innovative business models and practices, including yeah, models such as social enterprise, impact investing, and universal dig digital liter 
literacy, as well as, of course, the most important thing, uh, how to improve or up, upscaling, up, upskilling, yeah, upskilling this digital skill formation as part of the lifelong learning uh, among the, the, the communities. So over. Well, thank you very much for this. And you gave us a very, uh, a very frightening figure. Uh, 2.3 billion people are, are offline. And so that means that we are uh, many people in the same world with very, very different situations. So uh, this is the right point to call in Mr. He. I mean, he's the Deputy Director General for the World Trade Organization. And, 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 and because some argue that trade focuses on convenience uh, rather than solutions that improve the lives of the world's majority, and trade is sometimes an enemy. Now, uh, uh, Mr. He, is there a way to, to, to trade for a better widespread progress, so to mitigate the economic implication of COVID-19. I mean, how can you make trade more friendly for the whole of the world uh, using the technological instruments? Thank you, Chair. Hello, everyone. At the WTO, we were already well aware that digital technologies and the internet had become central to working, doing business, and of course, conducting international trade. The health crisis not only confirmed this, but further intensified the trend. WTO found that the impact of the pandemic on trade has been pervasive. Although world trade had already been slowing before the pandemic, Merchandise trade in nominal, uh, in nominal dollar terms was down 21% in second quarter of 2020 compared to the previous year, while commercial services trade was down 30%. For merchandise, it severely disrupted global value chains and delivery channels. Moreover, it altered trade compensation toward basic necessities, and health-related products. It also stimulated online purchasing over, in, over the internet. For services trade, the crisis caused travel and tourism to plummet for obvious reasons. At the same time, however, it boosted demand for a great many online services. Video conferencing, e-learning tools, telemedicine, and entertainment services became essential to people's lives. For these reasons, the pandemic affects many aspects of our work at the WTO. Our members have integrated into our agenda work on customs and investment facilitation to help build the necessary infrastructure for physical and the digital trade to flow. We are also exploring benefits for small and medium enterprises and principles for e-commerce. We pursue our work in these areas in the hope that trade will mitigate effects of COVID-19, foster economic growth, and improve the standard of living in developing countries. Thank you. Well, thank you to you. Um, it's the moment to drive ourselves into a totally different world. I mean, from WTO, which is the, the referee of trade, to those who do trade in, 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 in the largest way. So uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Daniel Trujillo is, is the executive vice president for Walmart. And Walmart is probably the biggest chain of stores and hypermarkets in the world. And uh, um, so it would be interesting to know from you how, uh, how has COVID-19 affected uh, uh, your way of working? And, and my newspaper, La Stampa, had an headline last week saying that you are uh, uh, cutting the number of robots in your hypermarkets and going back to have more people in the supermarkets. So basically, maybe this is one of the reactions. But uh, uh, what's your response uh, actually to the current pandemic crisis? 
Thank you very much and good morning everyone and thank you for the opportunity to be part of the forum with this group of selective, uh, selective uh, leaders. So I would like to touch uh, three key aspects. Uh, one is the e-government e deficit, the other one is the potential that we see and, and lastly I would like to talk about license permitting. Uh, you know, COVID-19 has unmasked the huge deficit in digitalization of government services, many of which have been largely paralyzed during periods of remote work because of over-reliance in paper and in-person steps. Yet, uh, COVID-19 has also shown uh, that rapid acceleration of e-government is every bit as possible as it is urgent and important for us. In our own experience in the private sector, we, our customers, suppliers, and other stakeholders have found uh, ways of hugely uh, accelerating digitalization of our own ways of work and customer proposition. We know it can be done. We are now resources in helping governments get up that curve quickly as well. In terms of licensing and permitting, Within e-government, digitalization of license permitting must be the highest priority right now. There are three key aspects why uh, we think that way. First, uh, across all governments, a stimulus in the form of deficit spending and monetary easing may be reaching its limit. So what is more needed, most needed at this point uh, is private sector funded shovel ready investment projects. This is exactly what is being held up by huge COVID era, uh, delays in license and private systems, for example. Any e-government will influence corporate investment planning over the medium term, but digital license and permit is about unlocking investment projects that have been already approved and which are just waiting on permits before shovels break the ground. Second, uh, direct and indirect users of license and permit systems include the entire public and private residential housing market, as well as corporate real estate, architecture and engineering firms, and almost any business. Um, so uh, that, that is, that is uh, any business that is seeking to grow. So, I mean, digitalization of license and permits uh, helps get a critical mass of public and private sector users to adopt digital tools. Uh, making it an on-ramp into a massified digital economy. Uh, third and lastly, uh, license and permit systems have historically been plagued by corruption. Uh, digital licensing and permitting ensures more efficient and reliable provision of public services and limits opportunities for corruption by strengthening uh, transparency and accountability. In short, digitalization of uh, license and permit system must be a top priority right now for COVID-19 recovery and resiliency. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that is key uh, and, and good for both public and private uh, governance. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, talking about uh, what governments and uh, public institutions and global institutions can do, uh, I would like to give the floor to Mukiza Kutui, which is uh, the Secretary General of ANCTAD. And of course, my question would be again, uh, how can an ethical and efficient use of technology uh, provide us with a solution to mitigate the emergency in the digital divide? But we have had from the floor uh, a question from Wolfgang, who, who, who's asking, uh, a comment on global digital taxation, whether it would be good or bad, and possibly, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kutui, this is something that you can comment, please. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank the brilliant panelists for very refreshing ideas that they have shared with us. Uh, in dealing with the ethical, the practical, the challenges for development today, uh, we have been trying to look at uh, what are the intrinsic challenges that are deriving from the pandemic? And how has the pandemic magnified challenges that were already pre-existing? Uh, a number of things come clear, as has come through from the others. The major digital giant platform companies 
have been the main beneficiaries of uh, the economics of the pandemic. Uh, as you could see, while the Dow Jones, Dow Jones uh, index was down 5% over the first, over the, the six months between March and September this year, uh, JD value went up 100%. Companies like Amazon, Apple, eBay, Tencent, Micro, Microsoft, and uh, Alibaba, their businesses gained between 40 and 50% in that period. So there's no doubt that uh, the stress for some has really been a, a gift for many digital businesses. And which just brings us to the main challenge. Those who are already not prepared for the digital economy have been further set back in the challenges. I just want to share with you some uh, recent study we did. We carried out a survey in 23 developing countries asking businesses and government what have been the main challenges of the rising significance of digital inclusion and, di and, and digital business during the pandemic. Now, 50% of the respondents from the business community were saying that the high costs of broadband services, which pre-existed the pandemic, became particularly important at a time when they had to transform more of their businesses online. Secondly, that in countries where governments have lagged behind in creating priority for e-commerce, you still have uh, the dinosaur issues of infrastructure, of policy priorities, the absence of clear regulatory framework, the absence of a clear policy and consistency on tax. Now on tax at this level, there's another side that has not been mentioned, which is because of the pressure for stimulus and public uh, revenue authorities having major squeezes in uh, raising taxes normally, we are seeing growing attention to further taxing of digital businesses, not just in the volume of services being offered, but digital startups facing entry point challenges because of the desire for more public revenue. And this is going to be a condition that will survive for some time. But there was also another pre-existing condition which has been exacerbated. The absence of harmony between growing e-commerce potential and fiscal logistics for cross-border movement of goods. I come from East Africa, where there has been significant growing capacity for online purchase of goods. Unfortunately, you find physically, because of the absence of clear protocols on cross-border movement of trucks with goods that have been electronically procured. For example, if you go to the border between Kenya and Uganda, you find trucks going back more than 50 kilometers in a queue because of the ambiguity of customs clearance, but more importantly, a credible procedure on health protocols at the border. These, these uh, non-digital challenges of logistics of a digital economy have been exacerbated, have been brought into clear light by the crisis we've gone through. Now, if I may just come back to the question you asked specifically about taxation. You remember in our World Digital Economy Report 2019, we had mentioned the unequal relationship between countries which are the drivers of digital, digital business and countries which are only included primarily as digital consumers. So the developmental challenge is how can consumers have something, whether it's service or any other form of gain beyond being consumers of a service that is now predominating uh, the, the digital space. This is very much related to the challenges of what is fair taxation. Unfortunately, the world has not structured these debates adequately. It is hostage to pressures that have affected multilateralism, particularly rule making at WTO. At other levels, a hostage to technology competition between giant countries, which even threatened to spill over into fracturing digital governance, I mean, uh, internet governance issues, as uh, is well known to all of you. But we have a number of specifics that the ongoing discussions about how to apply the ad minimis rule on the packages of digitally procured goods. How much is that fair to countries which look at these as opportunities missed to raise some taxation on imports, challenges on um, taxation of, uh, I mean, the value of data 
that is monetized by digital platform companies should benefits go partly to the sources of that data that is being modernized, being uh, uh, commercialized. And of course, the question of uh, pride pricing of duty on cross-border trade because of digital economy. I think this conversation has come to a point where the traditional interlocutors are insufficient from a development perspective. We increasingly must look to hear the voices of the most vulnerable trying to catch up and the most excluded in the benefits even when they are online with broadband. And I think that's uh, how I will respond to this. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, the point you raised about uh, digital customs, I think it's a crucial one, but it depends very much on, on digital education. So it's, it's, it's again, it's the beginning and, and, and the end of the story at the same time. So it's, it's definitely need a public effort to do this, but also investments. And, 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 and Dr. Marcel, you are the founder and managing member of, of, of the Resilience Capital Ventures. You, you, your job is to uh, uh, see that money gets invested in, 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 uh, in the emerging markets and uh, to foster growth and, and, and foster uh, a, a, a better life for everybody. So I, I was wondering, again, if you can tell us how can, uh, how can digital technologies in, in, from a point of view uh, help the world, especially the emerging markets and, and, the, and, and, and the less lucky parts of the world to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you so much. And uh, I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, we I want to I want to thank the the other um, panelists who have laid out many of the structural areas very well. And to speak specifically to your points about investment, I want to make a couple points. First of all, I think that the COVID nineteen pandemic has very clearly identified the structural uh, differences and variations across the world. And so the economic crisis that has come in the wake of COVID-19 has not been equal. And so for emerging markets and emerging countries where there was little participation in the digital economy, the crisis would have exacerbated that, those difficulties. However, that decoupling of the digital economy from what is happening in the real economy is also very clearly being seen also in countries like the United States and perhaps also in Europe, but particularly in, uh, in the United States and the Secretary General of UNTAD made reference to this, where you've had a decoupling of the very large players in the digital economy having had actually having had their market value increase significantly while there is considerable crisis in many other parts of the society and the economy. And I think that that is mirrored on a global scale. So what we find around the world is we find that the crisis has shown up the structural imbalances uh, across the world. Where I think that there is room for some optimism is that we've also seen tremendous flows of investment funds, capital being allocated into ESG and responsible investment funds. What we have not seen, and this comes to my hope for policy recommendation coming out of this, is that we have not seen a step up and an acceleration in blended finance models. So blended finance being not only the combination of private sector capital flows and public finance, but also increasing the emphasis on other forms of capital other than financial capital. And so if we had that sort of approach led perhaps by the UN system and other members of the international development community, we would be able to tackle the fact that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, all technologies are socially constructed. And so we should not be surprised. We only have to go back to the history of looking at digitalization, whether it's missing links, 
from the ITU, whether it's Knowledge Societies, from uh, Robin Mansell, where the UNCTAD had a very important role to play, to understand what have we missed in the last 20 years in not anticipating that we would have these kinds of digital divides. And also, no one has yet mentioned that there is a gender divide. And so the, the ways in which the digital divide shows up is not gender neutral. And so I would expect that UN women and uh, having played such an important role 20 years ago would be involved in developing any of the proactive solutions that this group and others may come up with in terms of how do we go forward. Just one uh, further point, I am encouraged also by seeing different forms of multi-stakeholder partnership. I'm, I'm particularly encouraged by something called the Green Economy Coalition that is looking at ways of ensuring that even the stimulus funds that are, uh, have been uh, you know, put forward in developed countries are used well, but with a view to having that done with a, uh, an ethical basis and also uh, having regard to inclusivity. So I think that there is, on one side, there is crisis and there's pain, but if we harness the intensity of this moment, there is also an opportunity to learn from it and to produce some of the policy changes that have been uh, you know, called for for some for some decades. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Marcel. And it appears from what you all say that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic have been uh, 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 drawing some dividing lines, increasing differences and increasing imbalances. So is a good moment to ask Mr. Anderson from the IMF about these differences and about the role that uh, technology uh, did play and is playing uh, during this crisis, uh, especially uh, related to the fact that now we have changed the way we are working. We are uh, mostly working from home. And so there's a new relation, a new way of working. So uh, how can we uh, be helped by technology, uh, uh, Dr. Anderson? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Marco, and also greetings to the other panelists. As the IMF's managing director has said many times, quote, digitalization is the big winner of the crisis, end quote. Uh, it's important to realize that the crisis has three phases. One, countries had to reduce uh, the amount of the lockdown measures, and many are now back in this stage. Two, they have to recover from the crisis, and three, as they're doing so, they have to build a more resilient economy. Technologies, of and of course the internet, are playing a different role for each phase. For phase one, as many of my co-panelists have explained, those who had access to the internet have been less impacted thanks to e-commerce, remote working, remote education, or digital payments. It's clear that while digitalization was an aspiration before the crisis in many of the least developed countries, it's now a necessity to get out of this crisis and become more resilient to future shocks. But instead of repeating what others have said on the benefits of technology, let me share some observations on the new digital risks and limitations that we've noted. Technology has not helped everyone equally. In every country from the USA to Ghana, the crisis has shown the significant negative impact of the digital divide, meaning those who have access to the internet compared with those who don't, those who can afford it, those who know how to use it, et cetera. Countries now uh, must now concentrate their efforts to provide connectivity to the hardest uh, populations to reach physically, economically, uh, or to access those, who, uh, those with digital and financial literacy constraints. Second, as you know, women have been particularly impacted during the crisis, and Dr. Marcel noted this as well, because they often have jobs that are not teleworkable. And more often than men, they tend to take care of the children who stay at home, and especially now stay at home. Uh, countries like Togo or Pakistan, for example, have recognized this issue and have used mobile phones to prioritize their cash transfer programs to women. 
This is an example of smart digital policy that makes sense economically. Finally, more digitalization and more internet services introduces more digital risks. Managing digital risks cannot be an afterthought. We, the international community, public and private sector have a responsibility to build uh, forward a better world that is safe, robust, and sustainable. Cybersecurity comes to mind, of course, but that's not all. We also have to prevent further digital divide or the concentration of digital power and data will remain in the hands of a limited number of big tech companies. Privacy also becomes more critical than ever as we produce more data in this new digital world. Thank you. Well, thanks. We are running a little bit late on schedule, but I think this is acceptable. And uh, uh, you just said, uh, uh, Mr. Anderson, that the big winner of the crisis is, is digital, but is it? Because soon after you underlined the problems that we are facing right now, and uh, this is why I, I invite you to, to explore now, to see what the role of the internet and, and, and the public digital policies can be in order to try to solve the problems you all been underlining so far, because things are getting better, but they are not working as, as well as we would expect. We've seen how many people are not connected, how many people are, have a bad line. Even here in Torino, I have a colleague who must come to the office every day because in his area, the connection is bad. And I'm talking about uh, uh, the, the northwestern part of Italy, which is supposed to be uh, rich and happy. So uh, the, second, the, the second session will be about this. I invite you again to try to uh, uh, respect when possible the three minutes uh, uh, ceiling for the conversation. And I will start again with Mr. Harrison from the African Union. And Mr. Harrison, uh, after you heard all this, uh, what would you ask uh, all of the stakeholders, the international institution, uh, uh, to, to help you in order to have a better economic uh, uh, recovery? Or to put it bluntly, is there a silver bullet to help Africa? Thank you. Uh, regarding IGP areas of cooperation, I will make three points, which seems to me particularly important. One, infrastructure. The development of digitalization cannot fall filed unless Africa address its sizable deficit in digital infrastructure. But you know, this is a big investment. Two, education. Education systems need, need to be remodelated by investing in education and rescaling programs for both basic and advanced digital skills to make sure African youth are employable and equipped especially for the post-COVID era in which digital skills will be at the core of many occupations. Three, macroeconomic and fiscal tools. Digital technology should be expanded to macroeconomic and fiscal policy tools to provide a host of digital solutions for economic transformation on the continent. As I mentioned earlier, a digital transformation strategy for Africa has been developed and adopted. And some initiatives have been taken to harness 
digital technologies and innovation to transform Africa's societies and economies, promote Africa's integration, generate inclusive economic growth, stimulate job creation, erase the digital David, David, and eradicate poverty to secure the benefits of digital revolution for social economic development. In this regard, the development of cooperation between stakeholders should be aligned of this framework and pursue the existing initiatives. And the framework for cooperation between stakeholders should be aligned with this continental strategy and continue the initiatives carried out. I thank you. Well, thanks to you. And we see that the African problem is, is is, is relevant, but also in Germany, there were troubles as, as, as in most of the European countries, in all of the European countries, there were troubles because of, of, of the COVID uh, uh, virus, the coronavirus, and, and generally experienced a, a, a big drop in, in, in the GMP. And, uh, and even if uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Bronstrup says us that in, in Germany, there was no, no failure, which is something that we would expect for Germany. On the other end, uh, not all went uh, in, in, in the right direction. So I was wondering, is there something high tech that you missed and what's the lesson you could draw from this very difficult months and year? Thank you. Yes, you're completely right, of course. Uh we uh, ran into economic trouble, as I mentioned before, due to the crisis. Um, and it's very difficult to estimate right now how that will go on. But um, right now we are quite optimistic. And this is also due to the fact that the German government uh, acted very quickly uh, in helping especially companies that have been affected by the crisis with the aim also to safeguard jobs, of course. Um, the German parliament decided on an assistance package of historic proportions. And uh, after that, um, because that was only the first step, we decided to invest much more in future technologies. Dr. Marcel asked for that right now. And I think that's, that is an important point we will have uh, to look into the future when overcoming the crisis. And that is why we will invest in future technologies. And that is true for uh, green technologies, but also for digital technologies, like for example, investments in artificial intelligence in a competitive European AI network um, in the construction of two quantum computers in Germany investments in the 5G network, investments in future communication technologies, but also in the automation in public administration. You mentioned that before, that it is very important for the citizens that uh, public services digitalized. That's, that's a view that we really share. So we are now confident that the program will help Germany to emerge from the crisis with renewed strength, but we will have to do that homework, of course. Thanks. Thanks, and danke. Um, of course, uh, heavy investments uh, can be a, a, a right solution, but still, sometimes you got to know and you got to have the right know-how in order to uh, know where you got to put the money. Because if you just put money in the wrong project, the effect will be uh, uh, non-existing, if not negative. So uh, again, uh, uh, and. Uh, Armida Ali Shabana and uh, Asia and Pacific. Uh, uh, in, we would, we've been discussing investments and projects. Could you, uh, could you share with us some of the initiatives uh, that you uh, planned and, and organized uh, in order to have a contribution to the digital transformation of the economic sectors? I mean, what was your, we've seen what Germany did and what was your action? 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question on the uh, specific maybe yeah, initiative that ESCAP has been supporting our member states and uh, stakeholders in our region. I can share uh, a few of these. Uh, for example, yeah, one, uh, at the request of the Pacific Island countries, and uh, as we know that uh, the, the Pacific is one of the uh, part of the region in, in Asia Pacific that are uh, in terms of this accessibility and in internet and so on is still yeah, under, uh, under, under uh, investment. Uh, therefore, ESCAP undertook an in-depth study that uh, recommended the establishment of the so-called shared internet exchange point between three countries, in this case, Fiji, Samoa, and New Zealand. And this will, of, of course, uh, dramatically improve internet accessibility, not only accessibility, but quality uh, across these, these countries. And hopefully, this initiative can be scaled up to other countries in that part of the region. Uh, second example is the cross-border paperless trade facilitation. This is an agreement, a member states in Asia Pacific, uh, which will enter into force uh, early next year, early 2021. So the idea is uh, how to have uh, a trade, yep, yeah, but um, uh, uh, through a digital trade, yeah. So all the documentation and so on is being fully uh, digi digitalized. Therefore, uh, there will be quite significant reduction yeah, in terms of trade costs uh, around let's say 10 to 30% of the existing transaction costs. So therefore this will further facilitate uh, the, 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 the trade, yeah. Um, another example, the third example is scaling up digitalization as well as uh, some concrete efforts along um, the Asian highway network. Yes, yeah, so the Asia Pacific, uh, the Asian highway network, uh, this is uh, in terms of transport, uh, connectivity, yeah. But then, of course, because of this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, then how, yeah, uh, we we can ensure facilitate uh, the the uninterrupted cross border freight transport movement. So therefore, this a uh, part of this is how to digitalize, yeah, uh, a part of the process uh, for the cross border uh, uh, freight movement. So these are a few of the examples that we at SCAP are working and, uh, with member states and to support them, uh, especially in times of this COVID-19, how to mitigate yeah, the socioeconomic impact, as well as how to facilitate several of the, uh, the, the you know, like cross-border uh, uh, trade and so on uh, to be uninterrupted. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary. And... Um... This is the kind of solutions you've been looking for countries that uh, seems to be far away, like, 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 like Fiji, but they still deserve uh, as much as all the other countries and the effort must be done. Um, the fourth industrial revolution with which we are living now and has been in a way uh, contaminated by COVID-19. And uh, that drives us to the necessity of, of finding uh, uh, um, solutions for a very important problem, which is the managing of data. Uh, the modern economy is built on, on data and more and more and more data are flowing around the world. So Mr. He, uh, you are Deputy Director General of the WTO, the trade organization. And uh, I, I wonder whether you can help us in understanding how can we manage uh, all, all, all this data and how can we protect them? Because having the possibility to, to have a free flow of data is, is very helpful for the world economy. But on the other hand, uh, the protection of, of privacy and the rights of the citizens uh, and of the companies is capital. So is there any advice, any plan you're working with and you can share with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, for this question. The discussions at the WTO since the start of the health crisis 
have helped governments better understand what is at stake in the global digital economy and the movement of data. In this respect, our e-commerce e talks have probably had the most visibility. The great increase in online transactions has contributed to resilience of supply chains and could offer future growth opportunities, particularly for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Our members are deeply involved in talks on enabling e-trade principles, including uh, data management and uh, uh, the, secure, uh, the uh, cyber security, this kind of uh, principles. We have also worked towards solutions through our own aid for trade mechanism, which involves many stakeholders and in partnership with, for example, ANCTA's e-trade for all initiative. Indeed, our e-commerce e talks gain new urgency due to the pandemic. We have conducted a dialogue with the private sector and NGOs, such as consumer associations and have sponsored seminars and the workshops on topics ranging from trade-related data governance to e-health and fintech. The trends linked to the pandemic not only demonstrated the importance of economic sustainability and recovery measures, but also cast a harsher light on the challenges. It became clear that underserved populations and the developing countries needed more and better connectivity. So we have a framework covering global sub, uh, supply of communication services but it will also require moving ahead, hand in hand with many other institutions and stakeholders. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, we've been discussing the role of, of the public administration and uh, it appears that most of the panelists are a, a, a little bit uh, uh, aware of the fact that things are not going as they should. So Mr. Trujillo, you are, you are private you are the market and so uh, and you made you made a, a case for digitalization of licensing and 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 permitting for better public and private governance uh, and that would help the resiliency towards the covid pandemic um, but how can this be done how, how do you see it from your own experience from the experience of your very large company Thank you for your question. The, the first point would be to keep it simple. Uh, so one of the greatest impediments for government, uh, governmental adoption, I would say, uh, has been that it's complex and costly. Uh, that means having some faith that if you do core digitalization work, it realigns incentives and capabilities in a way that makes additional improvements easier. So that would be number one. Secondly, um, uh, heads of uh, state of the Western Hemisphere committed at the last summit of the Americas to work on best practices and asked for coordination. So we in the Americas Business Dialogue have been part of a multilateral process coordinated by the Organization of American States, which uh, has settled on five best practices. Number one is all rules and fees uh, are online. Number two is pay and renew online as well. Uh, number three, digital single window for application, processing and external monitoring of progress. Number four, impact mitigation requests must be disclosed online to be binding. And finally, number five, training and, and certification of key personnel regarding how to do these best practices. Uh, the last point that I would like to make is the, the, what, we call, what is called the Trust in Business Initiative of the OECD. Uh, once you have, set of best, you have a set of best practices, certifying both the agencies that successfully implement and professionals who are trained uh, in the best practices creates a virtuous circle, boosting hiring and retention of well-trained people and giving those people an incentive to push Asian agencies uh, to be certified. Thank you for the opportunity. 
Thank you, Mr. Truillo. Um, the market is important uh, and, and, and the market in some regions, especially the small businesses are at risk right now. Uh, Mr. Kitui, uh, uh, watching the problem from the point of view of ANCTAD, I would be happy to ask you uh, which are the real policies, the policy areas that require cooperation, that require the cooperation of all the stakeholders. But before that, there's something you said before, and, and you said that you need uh, the internet and the digital development uh, to help uh, foster trade and commerce. But I was wondering whether this could harm uh, the small businesses and the small shops uh, in, in, in the African uh, countries. So isn't it, isn't it, it is definitely an opportunity, but maybe it's also a risk. What do you think about it? All right, <laughs> Th thank you very much. Uh, of course, the nature of trade is always determined by what is the quality of products is being traded. If it's end consumer products, particularly those that are also competing with local produce, then efficiency in arrival of digitally procured goods can put pressure on locally produced goods. But many times what we see is <clears throat> there's, there's part of that as a challenge. In fact, uh, our study shows that many startup internet trading companies, logistics companies, find it much easier to facilitate imports than exports for developing countries. I suppose part of that is the fact that uh, there is the fear of rejected return goods, which is mitigating how much you introduce new products from developing countries in developing more sophisticated markets. But be that, be that as it may, I think the main challenges we face are the following. Many small and medium enterprises in the developing world have been finding themselves niches and opportunities in global supply networks, global value chains, into which they provide a service or a product. And so where we are, what should be directly concerning is that in the days of the pandemic, it's basically an inflection point in what was already happening in the world. Uh, a combination of technology and economic nationalism have seen a major disruption in global supply networks with most production networks now being more localized domestically or in shorter regional uh, context. And that means that as the trends in investment become shorter distance geographically, as the content of investment becomes footlight, opportunities for small businesses and policymakers in developing countries have to realign to that new reality looking more for niches in more regional supply networks and more domestic markets than in the traditional sense of single profit seeking long distance investment patterns. I think that's one important area that, that, that has to be appreciated. But there's the other area. It is not possible to grow a regime of consumer protection and logistics facilitation without international cooperation. Because by the very nature of uh, the growing importance of digital uh, commerce, uh, there's need for strengthening protection of consumers, particularly when some people have been taking advantage of the strain and the urgency of the pandemic period to charge uh, scarcity profits on uh, either PPE requirements or urgent uh, produce that is needed to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Uh, and, and that I think this is an area of cooperation. Similarly, we need enhanced international cooperation if we can mitigate the very, very extreme disruptions of global hospitality industry and the related services. And whichever components can be digitalized, uh, assurance of quality and the standards of hospitality taking care of the pandemic are going to be important in the recovery hospitality industry and the related services. Well, thank you, Secretary General. I just uh, uh, call your attention to a written question we've had uh, from the floor on, on, on the role of, 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 of women in Sierra Leone, which we cannot take now, but I would ask you if you can answer it uh, on the floor later after this, this session ends. That would be more than welcome. Thank you. 
And so uh, we have rules, so we are asking for projects. And, uh, and Dr. Marcel, again, to have a, 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 a better and more fluid and more efficient uh, flows of, of uh, uh, flow of capitals, uh, which kind of policy recommendations uh, would, you, would you suggest, would you ask for in order to step forward and, and, and give the world a better, a better pattern of growth? Thank you for that question. In a sense, what uh, must happen is that policy and policy formulation has to catch up with what is actually happening in the world. Because we have had for at least two decades a situation where the geography of innovation has in fact changed, but policy recommendations and policy frameworks still treat the structure of innovation and the structure of finance in a very uh, outdated fashion. And so we should be updating our frameworks and mindsets vis-a-vis -vis knowledge flows we should be thinking about multipolar geographies rather than a single technology frontier. We should be focusing on bi-directional flows of knowledge as opposed to old fashioned technology transfer mindsets. And to illustrate, I want to give some examples of successful companies that have emerged during the pandemic period. And so you have companies such as Diatropics in Senegal, which is coming up with a very affordable testing kit. You have Tafari Capital and Technologies in South Africa that has developed a COVID tracing app, both for Lesotho and, um, and South Africa. You have Zinica that has come up with digital currencies in the, in the Caribbean. You have a number of examples of small venture companies as well as large companies that have actually pivoted and used this inflection point uh, beneficially. And I also want to make a point about where I think there is a real role for policy intervention vis-a-vis -vis the investment flows. I mentioned before that in the pandemic, you've had a tremendous increase in responsible investing, some 275% increase, so that you have $7.1 billion of investments, which are viewed as having a responsible investing uh, strategy. But that is still only less than 5% of all investment flows. Well, and that's- Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Marcel. And again, we are nearly on schedule. And Dr. Anderson, IMF. Uh, I mean, we have heard a lot of, of, of interesting suggestions. Uh, and I mean, you are such a big stakeholder. And I, uh, I'm asking you, uh, how should uh, stakeholders rethink their cooperation, if they have to do it, as it seems, around the internet governance for a better economy recovery? I mean. What should we do now, different, to make it better? Yeah, it's clear that the role and the impact, but also the expectations of digitalization from governments and citizens alike compared to pre-COVID have changed significantly. In fact, the situation is so different, it's probably fair to, to talk about a digitalization 2.0 era. The question becomes, how do we get the best of digitalization 2.0? And instead of watching digitalization developed unequally as it did, or as we saw with version 1.0, which was the pre-COVID version, can the international community shape its trajectory and not let a crisis go to waste? At the IMF, we're seeing a once in a lifetime opportunity to quote, build forward better, end quote. A world that's fairer, greener, and smarter. And the internet and technology play a central role to build this better world. For example, a fairer world is one where women who have been more impacted than men during the crisis, as I said before, 
have equal access to the internet. Did you know that in the last seven years, the gender digital divide has become worse, not better for the least developed countries? So governments and the international community must come together to look at how we can empower women with connectivity and digital finance in particular. Programs like Navisa in Togo, for example, have targeted mobile cash transfers to women. Tanzania and Zambia have experimented with free phones to the poorest women with great results. It just makes economic sense. We know that the expanding internet access in Sub-Saharan Africa by 10% of the population could increase real uh, per capita GDP growth by as much as four percentage points. Finally, and I'll conclude with this, more than ever, stakeholders must address the issue of the 46% of the globe that still doesn't have access to the internet. And the private sector will be instrumental in this post-COVID world. Take, for example, the organizations that are building and deploying low orbital satellites, companies like SpaceX. In less than two years, they will cover every inch of the earth with high bandwidth internet, assuming electricity is available. And there's another, and that's another priority for digitalization 2.0, which is availability of electricity. These low orbit satellites could leapfrog millions out of poverty in just a few years. It could be a game changer, but it has to be done in coordination with the public sector and international organizations. And it has to be done in a manner that is fair, smart, and green. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. And I mean, it's great. We are only two minutes out of schedule, which is a great performance for, for this governance forum. And so I, I take the chance to give back the floor to uh, each and one panelist uh, uh, for, let's say, a voluntary commitment or voluntary commitments uh, on, on behalf of their own individual or institution. Just to say in less than one minute, the last word for the day, which of course is going to be different from the one you're going to pronounce tomorrow, but this is the game we are playing. So uh, uh, let's start again from the beginning in less than one minute. Uh, uh, Mr. Harrison, African Union. Uh, 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 okay. How do you feel? Tell us. Thank you, thank you. For, for Africa, the cooperation between government, private sector and partners is crucial. So I continue to mobilize them to accelerate the implementation of digital transformation strategy for Africa. I thank you. Accelerate the, the, the implementation. Yes, we shall. Dr. Brunstrup, uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, Germany. What's your take? Mic on. Uh, mic on. Yes, you are. I'm, I'm sorry, I think you have a technical problem here. Can you hear me? Yes, of course, of course. You, you can hear me? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry for, for that. Uh, I couldn't right. hear you for a moment, so I, I'm not sure if I, I got the right question, but uh, uh, maybe as my final points, I would like to say how, how honored Germany was hosting the IGF last year and that we are still very much committed in advancing the progress um, that we are making in the international community, bringing forward all the international discussions on bringing forward the IGF. Um, we have been the facilitator in the process of recommendations 5A and B, and we are still very much in favor of bringing into the discussion parliamentarians, so the decision makers all over the world. Uh, there was a session yesterday where our parliamentarians uh, um, made the offer to coordinate a process with parliamentarians all over the world to bring them together with the discussions in the IGF. Um, and I would like to underline that and thank you all very much for the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you to you, Dr. Brunstrup, and thank you to your government. Um, Under Secretary uh, Eskap, uh, Ali Shabana, what's your final word for today? Yeah, uh, Eskap is very much committed to accelerate and scale up 
the implementation of the Asia Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative through one support member states to enable government policy for accelerated digitalization. Second, to promote women's economic empowerment by increasing access to finance and digital technologies, especially those in LDCs, LLDCs, and SITs. Third, to encourage young and social and innovators and entrepreneurs to leverage technology and innovative solutions. Thank you. I mean, thank you. Um, Mr. He, WTO, World Trade Organization, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think from our previous experiences, we can envision new and practical digital economy solutions that can help promote economic recovery and job creation. It is also clear that global communication uh, networks have demonstrated their role in the delivery of essential services and our outreach to less connected communities. We are convinced that trade rules and principles are not an obstacle, but are part of the solution. WTO can offer a path toward greater predictability, interoperability, trust, and lower costs for both businesses and consumers. I can only underscore the need for greater collaboration to facilitate cross-border movement of goods and services, narrow the digital divide and level the playing field for developing countries and small and medium enterprises. Thank you. Well, a, a, a level playing field is definitely needed. Uh, Mr. Tuiyu, Walmart, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I would like to mention two things. The first one, the America's Business Dialogue Commitment. We have already signed on the dotted line to commit to a public-private multilateral partnership that provides technical assistance and financial resources to governments that wish to implement the digital license permit uh, pra best practices. Uh, I invite governments to make their interests known. That would be number one. Um, as well, I, will, I, I am proud to be a founding corporate member at the Trust in Business Initiative of the OECD. And we have made a strong commitment to pair private sector compliance best practices with these public governance reforms that I've described before. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to you. And uh, Mr. Kitui, it, it's up to you. Well, thank you very much. I uh, very much uh, want to associate myself with the efforts that we can find through dialogue, methods of building sustainability because of shared benefit. <clears throat> um, the crisis of multilateralism today is because of the unequal benefits from multilateralist uh, globalization. And I think that should be a lesson as we enter the digital era that a fairer distribution of the benefits clear and development of competition policy that addresses questions of uh, gobbling up of adjacent businesses by uh, major platform companies, better distribution of the benefits and the value of global digital economy are going to be important. But I think going forward, we must also do more evidence-based ass assessment of the impact of digital economy on gender. Uh, vulnerable groups, particularly women groups in transitional societies, what has happened and what could be done better. Evidence-based affirmative progressive action is going to be necessary to make us generally say that we are sh sharing an agenda and a vision for a world driven by new opportunities. Well, thank you. And again, Dr. Marcel, your floor. Thank you so much. And thanks to the IGF for the invitation. I want to congratulate you on setting up a forum where we can actually continue to advocate for systems and mindsets that allow us to think about the ways in which we can mobilize capital, including financial capital, to ensure that we have sustainable human development that tackles intersectional areas of social injustice as well as mobilizes financial investments for digital infrastructures and also for digital societies. 
And so my commitment is to continue to be involved in the design of those strategies, as well as advocating for those ways of conducting ourselves in the international community. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Anderson, IMF. Uh, so again, thank you, uh, Marco, and thank you, IGF. Um, we've now entered a, the era of internet of value where payments and monies are exchanged almost as easily as information. Some countries are accelerating the adoption of digital monies, for example, with uh, CBDC, central bank digital currencies. But as I said before, not all countries have the same access to the internet and to digital skills. So we're facing the risk of balkanization, not only of the internet, but of the internet of value. The IMF is working with others, the BIS, the CPMI, the FSB, the WB, and we're committed to making cross-border digital payments as equitable and safe and as green as possible. Once again, thank you and thank you to the IGF. Well, thanks everybody. I mean, we made a sort of miracle. We are a little bit ahead of schedule. So I will take the three minutes that remain or even less to sum it up. I mean, it's been an interesting panel here and in, on the occasion of the 15th annual uh, IGF, the Internet Governance Forum organized by the UN. And we're living a very, a very painful uh, and, and, and dangerous crisis. But what we used to say is that we should never waste a good crisis or a bad crisis in order to make ourselves and our economy a better places. So uh, we have the impression that uh, the digital is something that will save us which is true, but it is not completely true because it is not the only solution. We must think big and wide and look beyond the walls and we shall invest in digitalization from what you said. But at the same time, we must remind that the world is made of people, which is something that Dr. Marcel was clearly saying before. Therefore, uh, digital should be aimed at educations and digital should be aimed at uh, fostering investments uh, and make them uh, uh, arrive in the right place. And there's a need, as was underlined by the speaker from Walmart and, and among the other speakers as well, in, including Mr. Kitui, there's a need of e-governments working in a better way. Uh, which means providing digital solutions and digital services in, in, in the most uh, uh, efficient uh, and, and, and resilient way, way in order to be made available to uh, everybody. Uh, there's a problem of, 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 of taxation as well. Taxation should be good to redistribute uh, uh, income and, and, and the welfare itself, but should not be uh, uh, let's say strangling uh, those who are smaller, they should be able to get get into the market. Uh, I would use the quote, keep it, I would add, uh, uh, keep it quick and, and, and be fast and be more pragmatical than political. Uh, you all are a part of, of, of the world. You are all engaging your lives to make the world a better place. Be more pragmatical and more efficient than political. And maybe we'll get out of it in a better solution, in, in a better situation as we hope right now. So uh, from, from Claudio Torino uh, in the Northwestern Italy and my office here at La Stampa, I thank all the participants for being here today. I won't name them again. Now you are great friends and you can continue your, your, your attending, I mean, I mean meeting yourself in, in, in the forthcoming occasions. And I thank the IGF for this opportunity for me to chair this very relevant and important meeting. And I wish you all the best for this uh, pandemic. It's not going to be easy. But I think that with a little bit of, of effort, a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of work, we'll get out of it safe and, 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 and soundly. So again, see you in a new uh, occasion. All the best. Thanks everybody. And thanks to both who have been listening to us. This is the end. Go home and be happy. <laughs>